declare a recess at any time. I want to welcome everyone to today's hearing on terrorist entry through the southwest border. I'll now recognize myself for an opening statement. Three days ago, we marked the 22nd anniversary of the Taliban-backed terrorist attack on the United States. Two weeks ago, we marked the second anniversary of the administration's surrender to the Taliban, turning over billions of dollars of military equipment and releasing more than 5,000 of the most dangerous terrorists on the planet from Bagram's Parawan detention facility. And on January 20th, we will mark the third anniversary of the Biden executive orders that opened our borders to the world by halting construction of the border wall, rescinding the Remain in Mexico policy, and forbidding ICE from enforcing court-ordered deportations. Since that day, more than 5.7 million illegal aliens from over 160 countries have illegally crossed our border. Mr. Biden has released over 2.6 million of them, a population larger than the entire state of New Mexico, into the United States in violation of our immigration laws. And while the Border Patrol has been overwhelmed by this unprecedented mass illegal migration, another 1.7 million known gotaways have entered as well. That's an additional illegal population the size of West Virginia. Now, since we have no access to most foreign criminal databases, we know little of the foreign criminal records of these 2.6 million illegal immigrants as they've been released into our communities. And of course, we know nothing of the 1.7 million gotaways. We know from a recent GAO report that many have already disappeared into our communities without a trace. Of 981,000 alien records they surveyed, they found that, quote, addresses for more than 177,000 were either missing, invalid for delivery, or not legitimate residential locations. According to the GAO, the lack of valid addresses means that ICE, quote, cannot locate migrants to enforce immigration laws including to arrest or remove individuals who are considered potential threats to national security. A much greater concern, of course, is the 1.7 million known gotaways, people the Border Patrol has observed entering this country, but could not stop because our resources are overwhelmed. Under the open border policies of the Democrats, if you illegally enter this country, seek out a Border Patrol agent and make a false asylum claim, you will almost certainly be released into our country. You will get taxpayer-funded travel wherever you want to go and lots of free stuff, including cash, food, free medical care, and even education. After six months, you can get work authorization. And when your asylum claim is finally heard and denied years from now and you are ordered deported, that deportation order most likely won't be enforced. So. Why would 1.7 million illegal aliens want to evade the Border Patrol? The only two reasons I can think of is that they're either hiding criminal records or they're conducting criminal acts. We do know that among those aliens the Border Patrol has apprehended, the number of suspected terrorists has increased exponentially. In 2021, we stopped 15 of them. That was five times the number encountered in 2020 and as many as we had stopped in the four previous years combined. By 2022, that number grew to 98. And in the first 10 months of this year, that number has already grown to 146, a tenfold increase in two years. In June, FBI Director Chris Wray testified before this committee that there has been an uptick in, quote, known or suspected terrorists coming across the southern border and that, quote, the southern border represents a massive security threat. Those are his words, a massive security threat. In August, we learned that a foreign national with ties to ISA helped smuggle over 120 uh, nationals of Uzbekistan, Russia, Georgia, and Chechnya into the United States through the southwest border. Press reports indicated that the FBI was, quote, scrambling to find the smuggled individuals since the Biden administration had released them into the U.S. And of course, this begs the question, if illegal aliens are so carefully vetted, as Mr. Mayorkas has repeatedly assured this committee, why would the FBI be scrambling to find them? Clearly, 
Very bad actors are entering our country through our open southwest border, and I'm afraid something terrible is brewing, either a coordinated terrorist attack by elements that have entered over the last few years, or the kind of cartel violence that has now become so common in Mexico. Now, the Democrats' witness will tell us not to worry our pretty little heads about all this. It hasn't happened yet. Well, that's precisely the attitude that the 9-11 Commission excoriated as the catastrophic failure of public policy that made us vulnerable to such a horror on 9-11. Our other witnesses, though, have a very different perspective. They've seen firsthand what's happening at the border, and they're desperately trying to sound the alarm before it is too late. I hope that we will all heed their warnings today. And with that, I'm pleased to recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome and good morning to our witnesses. It appears that this subcommittee has found a new angle to have the same border hearing that we have had six times already this Congress. Another hearing where we hear the same tired and untrue talking points about the southern border and actions by President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas. I'm not going to repeat them because guess what? These claims by my Republican colleagues actually empower smugglers to convince desperate migrants to pay for their services. When I read the CNN article that came out at the end of last month about migrants from Uzbekistan crossing the southern border with the help from somebody allegedly linked to ISIS, I wanted to learn more. Everyone on this panel wants to keep Americans safe. And the idea that individuals with ties to terrorists might be crossing our border and intending to do our country harm is deeply concerning. This potential issue is one that should be approached with an eye towards gathering the facts and information so that we can act accordingly. Unfortunately, that's not what this hearing is about. This hearing appears to be nothing more than political theater with little to new information. What bothers me the most is that my Republican colleagues use these hearings to weaponize the emotions of the American public to score cheap political points as we head into the next election. This is not about telling the truth or getting to the facts. This hearing is purely intended to scare the public, to demonize immigrants, and to score cheap political points as we head towards that next election. If the majority was serious about getting to the facts on this issue, Instead of holding this hearing, the subcommittee would have first let the Department of Homeland Security and Federal Bureau of Investigation give members a classified briefing on the topic, something that both the FBI and DHS have offered to provide us. My understanding is that the FBI and DHS have even offered specific dates on when this briefing can take place in the near future. Instead, the majority is once again here, oh, in, holding a hearing with no government witnesses, not a single government witness, where we will hear a lot of innuendo, hearsay, and scary-sounding rhetoric intended to play politics on the issue of immigration. This is not the way to conduct oversight, especially over a national security issue that belongs in a classified setting. This is not a serious hearing intended to gather facts and get to the truth, but while we're here, I think it's important for us to get some facts out there. Fact number one. In the last 48 years, going back to 1975, the number of Americans killed by a terrorist who crossed the southern border unlawfully is zero. That's right. Not a single American has been injured or killed by a terrorist who crossed our southern border without authorization. So don't fall for Republican fear-mongering. Fact number two. The only foreign-born terrorists who crossed the southern border unlawfully were three brothers from Macedonia who came to the United States while Ronald Reagan was president. 20 years later, they were arrested while planning an attack in New Jersey. Our systems worked then, but you certainly won't hear Republicans on this committee raise either of those two facts. Fact number three. Yes, there has been an increase in the number of migrants apprehended who are on the, quote, terror screening data set. These people have been apprehended, and they receive additional vetting and interviews from DHS as a result. There is also coordination with the FBI on the appropriate action that should be taken when responding to these individuals. If it is determined that these individuals pose a serious threat to national security or public safety, they may be de denied admission, detained, removed, or turned over to another agency for prosecution as appropriate. All of this could have been discussed with a classified briefing. 
but that is not the path that the majority chose because they are not interested in the facts. And as is my refrain every single time we have these hearings, if the majority was at all serious about addressing immigration in America, they would be working with us to pass bipartisan immigration reforms that would finally update our outdated immigration system so that we have real legal pathways for people to enter the United States, to be with their families, to escape terrible situations in their countries, and to contribute to our economy, our communities, and our country. That is what would decrease the number of people coming to the southern border. That is what would allow Border Patrol agents to focus on true security threats. And that is what would allow more people to go through detailed vetting before ever coming to the United States. That is how we can improve our national security. Instead, some Republicans have openly said that they want to defund the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. And last year, almost every one of them voted against the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which provided additional funding to ports of entry for non-intrusive in inspections to combat smuggling of people and drugs, modernization, and additional staffing. Unfortunately, we have another hearing today that prioritizes cheap political points and outrage over action. So let the show begin. Uh, just to correct the record, we did request a classified briefing uh, from DHS and the FBI on this uh, subject, uh, and uh, they said the earliest they could get to it was September 29th, and we look forward uh, to uh, them meeting uh, that, uh, that request. Uh, I uh, see that the chairman of the full Judiciary Committee is here, and I would recognize him for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On Monday, we commemorated the 22nd anniversary of the horrific attacks on September 11th. None of us will ever forget the terror of that day or the bravery of the first responders who rushed toward danger to save countless lives. To so many people, the wounds from 9-11 still feel fresh. The grief and pain is ever present. Among the many ways that our lives changed after the events of that terrible day, September 11th served as the catalyst for a sea change in our immigration system. The 19 hijackers who carried out the attack came to this country legally on visas in response to the intelligence failures that allowed them to enter, plan, and execute the attacks, we created the Department of Homeland Security. This led to massive increases in funding, vetting, and enforcement within the immigration system. As a result, immigration became inextricably linked with national security. While in many ways we are safer today, there are also many problematic aspects to this approach, not the least of which is that asylum seekers are too often treated like criminals by our government. However, one thing is certain. The federal government is deeply focused on keeping Americans safe from threats domestic and foreign, and attacks by foreign-born terrorists on U.S. soil since 9-11 are vanishingly rare. I am sure that my Republican colleagues will do their best to scare people into believing that the next 9-11 is just around the corner, and this time, they will claim, it will be planned by someone who snuck over the southwest border. But the fact remains that there has never been a successful attack planned by someone who illegally crossed our southwest border. Even the cherry-picked examples that we will likely hear about today tell a story about the rigorous vetting done by DHS and our intelligence agencies to keep us safe. For example, much has been made about recent reports that asylum seekers from Uzbekistan were aided by a struggler, by a smuggler with ISIS sympathies. But we know about those alleged ties precisely because of investigative work done by intelligence agencies in coordination with immigration enforcement agencies working together, as they should in a case like this. The FBI is continuing to identify and vet this group of individuals, even after the National Security Council stated publicly that there is no indication that any of the people who actually entered the U.S. have any connection to a foreign terrorist network. Of course, we won't learn anything new about these migrants today. That's because this slapdash hearing was pulled together to make headlines, not progress. As has become commonplace in this subcommittee, there are no government witnesses today. No one who can provide a thorough accounting of what this government is currently doing to address potential threats. The FBI and DHS have offered to provide members of the classified briefing about this incident, but a classified briefing doesn't get anyone a spot on Fox News. So here we are, about to commence yet another hearing to demonstrate just how unserious my colleagues are 
about fixing the problems plaguing our immigration system. If they wanted to improve things, they would have joined with Democrats when we appropriated hundreds of millions of dollars to provide new technology, inspection systems, and CBP, CBP officers to the border in last year's omnibus spending bill. Not a single Republican member of this committee voted in favor of that bill. And now many of them want to defund DHS, DOJ, and the FBI, or else they will shut down the government. These extreme MAGA priorities are dead wrong, and the American people are watching. <coughs> I thank the witnesses for appearing in front of us today, and I yield back the balance of my time. And yields back. Uh, the uh, chair recognizes the arrival of the uh, chairman of the House Judiciary I, Committee. I, Mr. I, Jordan is recognized for an opening statement. Well, I'll be brief. I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for doing this hearing. I just want to respond to the to the ranking member of the full committee's statement that you know, you, you, no one from the government's here to give us answers. We've been asking for answers from those guys for I don't know how long. We wrote we wrote Secretary Mayorkas before he came in front of this committee. Seven weeks ago, we wrote him the week before saying, hey, here are questions we want you to be prepared to answer. This is, this is, like, the, this is like the professor telling you, hey, these, these are the questions I'm going to ask you on the exam. And he came to the committee and wouldn't answer the questions. We asked him multiple. We asked him a simple question, not even on the terrorist issue. We asked him a simple question. We said, how many of the two, over 2 million people have been encountered on the border, how many of them have been adjudicated and, and, and been removed from the country? He wouldn't answer the question. Mr. Gates asked him. Mr. Roy asked him. I asked him a couple times. Finally, I said, is, it, is the number greater than zero? He would agree to that, but he wouldn't tell us the number. We then followed up with a letter to him. What's the answer? Still no response. So the idea that we're, we're, we, don't want, we're not, we don't want answers and someone from the government can give them to us is baloney. We have tried and tried and tried. That's why we're probably have to do some compulsory uh, uh, resources to um, to get some, try to get some answers for the American people. But I appreciate the leadership of the subcommittee chairman on so many important issues that have been in front of this committee and um, would yield back. Uh, thanks. Without objection, uh, all other opening statements will be included in the record. Uh, and I'll now introduce uh, today's witnesses. Our first witness will be Mr. Todd Benzman. Uh, Mr. Benzman is the Texas-based Senior National Security Fellow for the Center for Immigration Studies. Prior to that, he led counterterrorism intelligence for the Texas Department of Public Safety's Intelligence and Counterterrorism Division. He's written about and routinely reports on the U.S. border crisis. Mr. Benzman holds an MA in Security Studies from the Naval Postgraduate School, the Center for Homeland Defense and Security, and an undergraduate degree in Journalism from Northern Arizona University. Our second witness will be Mr. Charles Marino. Uh, Mr. Marino is a national security expert who served as senior law enforcement advisor to DHS Secretary Janet Napolitano from 2009 to 2011. He was a career uh, Secret Service uh, officer during three different administrations. He is a graduate of the National War College, from which he received an MS in National Security Strategy, and is currently an adjunct professor at the uh, University of uh, South Carolina. Uh, the minority, of course, gets to choose a witness. They did not choose any uh, administration officials, uh, but uh, we have with us today at their invitation Mr. Uh, Alex uh, Norista. Did I have that right? Narasta. Narasta, thank you. Thank you for asking. Mr. Narasta is the Vice President for Economic and Social Policy Studies at Cato Institute. He's written on the economic impacts of immigration on the economy. Mr. Narasta received a BA in economics from George Mason University and an MS in economic history from the London School of Economics. And then finally, uh, returning to the subcommittee is uh, Chief Rodney Scott, who served 29 years in the United States Border Patrol before retiring as chief of the Border Patrol in August of 2021. During that time, he held numerous leadership positions at various stations and sectors along the southwest border, as well as several leadership and specialized assignments uh, at U.S. Customs and Border Protection uh, Headquarters. I want to welcome all of our witnesses, uh, thank them for appearing today, uh, and uh, I'll begin by swearing you in. Would you please rise and raise your right hand? Uh, do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? So help you God. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record uh, in its entirety. 
Uh, so accordingly, we'll, we'll ask you to summarize your testimony in five minutes. Uh, and Mr. Benjamin, we'll begin with you. Thank you for holding this hearing about a national security consequence of the worst mass migration crisis ever to have stricken America. The consequences this threat of this is the threat of terrorist entry over that border. And evidence demonstrates the mass migration crisis has elevated that threat, as I'll explain. After 9-11, DHS developed border counterterrorism programs that did prevent terrorist infiltration into the United States. A threat, by the way, that the 9-11 Commission expressly warned about. Programs established in 2004, perhaps aided by sheer luck, have thwarted numerous border crossers for 20 years, as I documented in my book, America's Covert Border War. The sole illegal entrant who has carried out an attack since 9-11 was a Somali who sympathized with ISIS and crossed illegally at San Ysidro and was released and went on later to strike Edmonton, Alberta, Canada in 2017. But the ongoing border crisis has rendered those counterterrorism programs unviable now. One of the most impactful of those systems directly directed border patrol agents to tag migrants as special interest aliens if they hailed from listed countries where terrorist groups operated. ICE would detain special interest aliens until federal agents could interview and debrief them as part of enhanced security investigations. Derogatory results led to many deportations, which kept Americans safe. A recent CNN report, however, revealed just the latest evidence that this interview program has broken down. DHS went into red alert after discovering a human smuggler tied to ISIS had brought at least a dozen Uzbekistani special interest aliens over the border. They were all quickly freed into the interior like most other illegal immigrants of late without being interviewed. We know this because CNN also reported that U.S. authorities mounted a nationwide manhunt for the Uzbekistanis so that they now could conduct the interviews. This episode is only the latest revealing failures in our border screening systems. If you won't believe me, review the July report of DHS's Office of Inspector General, which detailed how Yuma Sector Border Patrol agents accidentally freed a Colombian national on the terror watch list. Authorities found the man in Tampa two long weeks after he was accidentally released. Why did this happen? The IG blamed the mass migration chaos for the alien's release. The Yuma agents let him go because they, and I quote, were busy processing an increased flow of migrants. And because, quote, the increase in Yuma apprehensions had created pressures to quickly process migrants and decrease the time available to review each file, end quote. Expect those screening programs to be degraded indefinitely because vast numbers of special interest aliens are currently pouring through the Darien Gap between Colombia and Panama. Usually 10,000 migrants or less pass through the gap. In 2023, however, 300,000 plus have gone through the gap. And whereas only 3,000 or 4,000 special interest aliens among them reached our southern border annually, the Daily Caller just reported that 75,000 came in just the last nine months. DHS cannot possibly vet or even interview a fraction of these numbers, raising the terrorism risk. And whereas about 20 aliens on the terror watch list were caught at the southwest border in prior years, since this crisis began in 2021 through the end of July, Border Patrol apprehended an almost implausibly large number of them, 258 as of now. Those watch listed 258 are just the ones Border Patrol managed to catch. Border Patrol failed to apprehend a record-breaking 1.8 million migrants who slipped into the interior. Mass migration-related system failure is indicated in Mexico, too. In July 2021, Mexico released a watch list to Yemeni to clear their overcrowded detention centers, and that set off another manhunt. I don't know if he was ever found. 
The case of a Lebanese Venezuela who crossed from Matamoros to Brownsville in December 2021, who was flagged on the FBI watch list is another one. Against FBI recommendations to hold the Venezuelan, ICE ordered his release on grounds that he might catch COVID. Last I heard, he was in Detroit pursuing an asylum claim. These incidents above and others described in my written testimony reveal the system is blinking red. So fingers crossed. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we'll next hear from Mr. Marino. Thank you, Chairman McClintock, Ranking Member Jayapal, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today to testify about this important topic. On the heels of the 22-year anniversary of the horrific attacks against this country on September 11, 2001, we are all reminded of the sacred responsibility that the U.S. government has to safeguard the homeland by creating and implementing effective policies to prevent another such act of terrorism. It is in this spirit that I served within the Department of Homeland Security to help protect this country for two decades under both parties and continue my work in national security today as an adjunct professor at the University of South Carolina, where I teach future generations the important process of developing comprehensive national security strategies. While the current volume of threats against the United States are undoubtedly robust in number, they are also more diverse and originate from more places than at any time in our history. But while the threat environment is constantly evolving, what must remain consistent is the indisputable need for both border security and immigration enforcement as essential strategic elements necessary to prevent bad actors from entering the country in the effort to best secure the homeland and ensure the sovereignty of the United States. This is most certainly not happening now. So it is disappointing that I appear before you today to state the obvious. The border and immigration policies of the Biden administration have made the country less safe since 9-11 by directly undercutting the very purpose for creating the Department of Homeland Security under the 2002 Homeland Security Act and by further subverting the statutory responsibilities of the Border Patrol, ICE, and practically every other agency tasked with protecting the homeland. After the U.S. government was criticized for a failure of imagination by the 9-11 Commission, our government promised all Americans that never again, never again would the country fall victim to future terrorist attacks on its soil. Despite that promise, it is blatantly obvious that the Biden administration is suffering from the same failure of imagination that took place then and foolishly underestimating how easily our adversaries, including terrorist groups, can and will exploit our open borders with the help of the Mexican cartels to kill innocent Americans. We must do something before it's too late. We are all aware of the catastrophic amount of fentanyl entering our country, killing approximately 70,000 Americans per year, and the unprecedented level of human trafficking, modern day slavery, as well as the unsustainable influx of undocumented migrants that fleece Americans of their resources without paying back into the system. But we must also start paying attention to the imminent ter terrorist threat that the cartels and others pose to the country. After all, if the cartels will work with China to kill thousands of Americans via fentanyl, shouldn't we assume that they would also work with other adversaries and terrorists for the right price to facilitate illegal entry into the country? If anyone is not thinking this way, let me respectfully suggest they start immediately. With almost 200 migrants on the terror watch list which have been apprehended while trying to sneak across the border, the natural question is, 
So how many on that list have made it in? Recently, more than a dozen Uzbekistan nationals smuggled in by a suspect with connections to ISIS were released into the United States, with some missing, just as many of those from the Afghanistan withdrawal debacle who were ushered onto our soil without thorough vetting. While I was in my role at DHS, these types of situations were always on top of mind and would have been cause for alarm. It is time to allow law enforcement to do their jobs and reestablish deterrence through enforcement. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll hear from Mr. Narasta. Chairman McClintock, Ranking Member Jayapal, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Over many decades, the Cato Institute has produced original research on immigration and sober evaluations of the realistic threat of foreign-born terrorism. Terrorism is a serious topic, so serious that we should focus laser-like on data and facts. We cannot let ourselves be distracted by fiction or speculation. This focus on data and facts requires looking at the past, which is the source, of course, of all data about terrorism. The title of this hearing is Terrorist Entry Through the Southwest Border. When I first heard that was the title, my reaction was, what terrorist entry through the Southwest Border? Zero people have been murdered in attacks committed by terrorists who entered as illegal immigrants. Zero people have been injured in attacks committed by terrorists who entered illegally. Zero attacks have been carried out by immigrants who entered illegally. Now, nine terrorists have entered the United States illegally since 1975. Five of them illegally crossed the U.S.-Canada border. One was a stowaway on a ship, and three of them, Dritten Duca, Elsevier Duca, and Shane Duca, entered illegally through the U.S.-Mexico border in 1984. At the time of entry, Dritten Duca was five years old, Elsevier Duca was three years old, and Shane Duca was one year old. In 2007, they were convicted as part of the Fort Dix plot, which was broken up by law enforcement during the planning stage. Zero asylum seekers who became terrorists entered through the U.S.-Mexico border. Thirteen terrorists have entered as asylum seekers, and they are responsible for nine murders and about 669 injuries and attacks on U.S. soil since 1975. But none of them crossed the southwest border. There have been zero attacks by illegal border crossers who were flagged by the Terrorism Screening Database, also called the Watch List. Federal prosecutors have not filed charges related to a terrorist plot on U.S. soil against anyone who entered between a port of entry and who was flagged by the Watch List. Almost all individuals listed in the Watch List are not terrorists. Data released by the Washington Examiner showed that 25 out of the 27 Watch List hits encountered by Border Patrol in the first months of 2022 were citizens of Colombia. If they were even members of a foreign terrorist organization, they were likely members or former members of FARC, FARC offshoots, or other insurgents in Colombia. There has never been a terrorist attack committed on U.S. soil by these Colombian foreign terrorist organizations. There is no publicly available evidence that they have ever intended to target the U.S. homeland in a terrorist attack. And no foreign-born person from Colombia has ever committed, planned, attempted, or been convicted of attempting to commit terrorism on U.S. soil. Special interest aliens, or SIAs, are a supposed terrorism concern along the U.S.-Mexico border. DHS has a fancy definition of SIA, but the reality is that the SIA designation is a label for illegal immigrants from a country that could have terrorists and nothing more. SIA is not a meaningful metric to understand the threat of terrorism along the border or anywhere else. Although terrorists who cross the U.S.-Mexico border have never murdered or injured anyone in a terrorist attack on U.S. soil, there is, of course, a chance that a foreign-born terrorist could cross the U.S.-Mexico border and commit an attack at some point in the future. It's got to be above zero. The way to reduce that threat is to vastly expand legal immigration 
to diminish the numbers of illegal immigrants down to very low levels. Such a liberalization and deregulation of immigration would allow Border Patrol agents to focus their efforts more fully on deterring security threats instead of trying to centrally plan international labor markets. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, finally, we'll hear from Chief uh, Rodney Scott. Chief Scott. Chairman, ranking members, members of the subcommittee, <clears throat> good morning. I would like to share with you three critical facts that I learned while serving as a Border Patrol agent. The most critical fact is that border security is national security. It's not a political talking point, it's a fact. Over my career, I was honored to participate in the transition from an uncontrolled, chaotic southwest border to a border that was arguably more secure than ever. Unfortunately, I also witnessed the rapid and systematic destruction of decades of improving border security in just the first few weeks of the Biden administration. To be blunt, the systematic destruction of border security and the predictable consequences scare the hell out of me, and they should scare you too. As a young frontline agent, I routinely observe smugglers coordinate distractions to get illegal aliens past Border Patrol. A common distraction was as simple as a couple of very fast teenage males making a highly visible illegal entry, and as agents shifted to chase that bait, the real group of illegal aliens would rush across the border through the gap that was created. This same tactic was used by drug smugglers. Agents would respond to a group of illegal aliens or a vehicle illegally entering, and as soon as they responded, a more significant load of narcotics would come through just out of their reach. Mexican drug cartels over my career have increasingly asserted control over all crossings between the ports of entry. Their sophisticated tactics and techniques continually improve, but the basic concept remains the same. Create a distraction too good for agents to ignore and then exploit the gap that's created. Any alien with something to hide will routinely pay to evade law enforcement to be in that second wave. That's the second critical fact, that, most, that the most serious threats to America are more commonly in that second wave. People don't understand that U.S. law enforcement records checks search U.S. databases. Crimes committed by a foreign national outside the U.S. rarely appear in these databases. That's the third critical fact, that records checks are just a tool to support a meaningful interview. Earlier this week, America paused to remember 9-11 terrorist attacks. 9-11 had a profound impact on my understanding of border security. In the years following, I was honored to represent Customs and Border Protection on several interagency uh, teams, and we were tasked with improving America's anti-terrorism capabilities. Like then, we knew, or then, like now, we knew that terrorist organizations were going to increasingly seek to use operatives that were unknown. We could not rely solely on records checks. CBP improved situational awareness through intelligence and expanded capabilities of officers and agents so that they could solicit information and determine intent, intent through effective interviews. Additionally, Border Patrol improved surveillance and doubled down on deterring illegal immigration. And it was working. Fewer illegal entries and an expanding smart wall system bought agents more time. With more time to invest in interviews, the benefits cascaded quickly. The agents <clears throat> were able to identify imposters, fraudulent families, gang members, various criminals, and even potential terrorist ties that records checks had not revealed. In contrast, every single border security and immigration action that the Biden administration has taken has resulted in an increase in illegal immigration, overwhelming CBP capabilities, and sur <clears throat> surrendering control of our southwest border to the cartels. Every illegal alien released into the United States is free advertisement for the cartel and ensures an endless wave of customers to overwhelm agents. Of great concern is the increasing number of Border Patrol encounters with illegal aliens on the national watch list. From 2017 to 2020, Border Patrol encountered 14 illegal aliens on that watch list. But from 2021 through 2023, that number jumped to 263, with 149 of these being in just this year alone. This is a serious national security threat, but it only represents the known. What threats were in the 1.7 million known gotaways? What about the unknown gotaways? Compounding this threat, overwhelmed officers and agents no longer have time to conduct meaningful interviews. Border Patrol is overwhelmed with illegal aliens from several countries that are known to be affiliated with terrorism. 
but those agents cannot get timely language translation support to conduct the most basic processing, let alone a meaningful interview. This continues even asked after the discovery of the ISIS-associated smuggler that helped Uzbekistanis enter the U.S. illegally. The release of those Uzbekistanis demonstrates the vulnerability of overly relying on data systems for our national security. The key to effective law enforcement and border security will always be face-to-face -face interviews. The ongoing massive illegal immigration is a threat to our national security. And didn't we all promise after the 9-11 to never forget? Look forward to your questions. Greg, I want to uh, thank you and all the witnesses for their testimony. We'll now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions, uh, and we'll begin with Mr. Biggs. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's good to see um, that we're having this hearing. Uh, so this notion that being concerned about terrorists entering through the southwest border which is absolutely open, is that somehow is fiction or speculation, is probably one of the most asinine pieces of testimony I have heard in Congress. It's astounding. I find myself saying, have you, have you never been to the border? Have you seen what's going on at the border? Do you know what's going on at the border? I go down often, real often, and I look at data constantly. And the biggest piece of data that you have ignored is the 1.7 million known Godaways. Those are known Godaways. The unknown Godaways are probably match it one for one minimum. Have you ever stood in a group of individuals, as I have, and you say, where are you from? Russia. Oh, really? And uh, there's 40 of you. You're about, all about 25 years old. And then we bring a translator in. All of a sudden, they don't speak Russian. They say they're from Georgia. Bring a different translator in. They say, oh, well, yeah, we really are Russian. The number of people coming across that we can't even vet through, through the process when we, when, when we encounter them, or through CBP-1. Or we're sending them to the, to the ports of entry. I find it astounding that anybody would, this, this, is, this is the problem. This is the problem. We've got people just say, just, just say, they're the ones that are engaged in fiction and speculation. Actually, it's, it's not fiction and speculation. It's a great big dream. And it's a hope and a wish. Because it's going to be people like you who get to say, yeah, we were wrong. When a terrorist does engage in activity in the homeland. I'm just astounded, flabbergasted by that testimony. And I've heard a lot of weird testimony in here uh, since I've been here. Chief, Chief Scott, tell us a little bit about this notion. So, so we're, we're also told that if somebody's on the, on the terrorist watch list, it's no big deal, right? It's really no big deal because they, they haven't committed an act of terrorist. Why do we have a terrorism watch list, and why is that important and relevant? It's important and relevant because our intelligence agencies and law enforcement are always looking to put Border Patrol, to put law enforcement in general in a better position to keep America safe. So any kind of derogatory information <clears throat> links to terrorism, and obviously there's other agencies that could testify this more, are, are looked at, and people that meet certain criteria, there's reasonable suspicion to believe that they're tied to these threats to America are put on that list. But by the way, that's only, again, the knowns. Right, so, so we get to this point. Um, are there nations in the world that we have no information whatsoever uh, about, we can't get any background on, on these people, even if we do encounter them and actually have a chance, which we don't really have very often, to interview them? That would be the vast majority of the globe. Yeah. We have very little information. We act on what we have, but when you think about the total population of the world, we have very, very minuscule data on how about, anyone. How about with Mauritania? Do we have, sorry? How about with the country of Mauritania? No. Yeah, see, the reason I say that is because we're now starting to see groups of Mauritanians come in through, the, uh, through Arizona. I got a call from a CBP uh, agent last week. I said, what's going on? He said, a group of 250 Mauritanians. I said, well, how are we doing there? Do we have any way to vet them? No, no way to vet them. Mr. Bensman, you're, you're, you get down to 
to the border off, and I know that. Tell us about the Darien Gap. Is any vetting going on there before they move on from the Darien Gap up through the Northern Triangle states on up to the U.S.? In the Darien Gap right now, there must be, uh, you know, 50,000 pouring through. Michael Yan, some other reporters are there right now sending us video. It's unbelievable what's happening, the numbers coming through. In normal times, when it's 10,000 or less, uh, American and Panamanian officials have uh, a biometric program where they try to, you know, fingerprint and photograph, you know, and, and take, take some, uh, you know, collection on almost everybody that crosses through there. Impossible to do that right now. Impossible. The numbers are just flabbergasting, huge. We can't ca collect the uh, bit. So, so as, we, as we go here and I close here, Cato's position is for an open border. Sports an open border. Uh, this is what an open border looks like. Yield back. Uh, Ms. Jayapal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I said earlier, I and everyone on this panel want to keep Americans safe from real security threats. And that's why I'm disappointed that we didn't wait just the two weeks that we, we know we uh, have so that we can get an actual classified briefing from the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. Having a hearing where the Republican majority tries to scare the public and demonize immigrants is not how we're going to make America safer. It's only going to serve to further divide us and prevent us from working together to find common sense bipartisan solutions that improve our national security. One way to do that is to expand legal pathways for people who come to the United States lawfully. Unfortunately, the Trump administration decimated our refugee and legal immigration systems, increasing migration from all over the world to the southern border. The Biden administration has worked hard to rebuild the refugee program and has tried to expand legal pathways using parole, but only Congress can provide permanent solutions. So Mr. Narasta, let me turn to you. Congress has not expanded the number of legal immigrants that we accept in over 30 years. You mentioned in your testimony that the expansion of legal pathways would help improve our national security. Can you describe how that is so? Uh, yes, expanding legal pathways will vastly improve uh, security. Uh, being able to vet immigrants before they arrive would absolutely increase domestic security and further discourage terrorists or, or other bad actors from even trying to come to the United States in the first place. You know, many um, people who come here unlawfully today would uh, love to come through a legal system where they can work lawfully by expanding legal opportunities. It will drive the vast majority of them into the legal system, and then that will allow Border Patrol and these other agencies to focus on the small number who remain. And you mentioned in your written statement some examples of how the Biden administration has used parole to expand lawful pathways. Can you discuss some of those examples here in more detail and how they actually contributed to decrease numbers at the southern border? Yes, we know uh, for a fact that expanding legal immigration works because of recent experiences with uh, parole, uh, specifically. Parole allows Americans to sponsor, uh, at least in these cases, to sponsor foreigners from specific countries to come to the U.S. to work and live uh, for a period of time. Uh, there's the Uniting for Ukraine uh, example, which was uh, implemented in May of 2022. It reduced the total number of Ukrainians showing up at the U.S.-Mexico border by 99.9% from April 2022 to July of 2023. Uh, and then there are similar parole programs uh, that the administration put into effect for people fleeing uh, Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Haiti that also reduced uh, illegal entries. So, for example, uh, Venezuelan illegal entries fell 66% from September of 2022, the month before the program was put into effect, to July of 2023. And then um, from December of 2022 through July of 2023, illegal entries from Haiti uh, fell 77%, 98% from Cuba, and 99% from uh, Nicaragua. Parole is a great uh, short-term stopgap measure. It has proven, I think, empirically once and for all that increasing legal pathways reduces illegal immigration, increases border security. Immigration liberalization, though, is the only sustainable long-term fix to border chaos. 
Thank you. One of the other places that the president can act unilaterally is by increasing the number of refugees that the administration accepts. And I'm happy to see that the Biden administration is on pace to welcome the highest number of refugees since 2016. Very briefly, because I have one other question for you that I want to get to, what are some additional ways that the Biden administration can expand and grow the refugee program? Yeah, so the Welcome Corps is a great opportunity for Americans to sponsor folks, modeled on the Canadian system, uh, rewritten on that, that at Cato. But I think the easiest number one way to do it is uh, for him to expand parole to other countries. Uh, for Guatemalans, Hondurans, Salvadorans, uh, Colombians, and others fleeing dangerous, despotic, socialist, poor, cruel regimes, and to allow Americans to sponsor folks and to increase the cap for the CHNV countries. I think they should be numerically uncapped. They should only be capped by the generosity and willingness of Americans to sponsor people. Thank you, and lastly, I know you've studied the nexus of terrorism and immigration quite extensively, and your, your testimony is very different from some of the people that are sitting right next to you. Why do you have such different perspectives? I think it comes from our different approaches to studying topics in general. I like to look at the data. I like to zoom out to take a look at the big picture, to take a look at the actual risk, to use normal uh, analysis, risk analysis used by the government in other areas, by insurance companies, by others to, add, uh, to look at that, to read through uh, some of this other research out there. A lot of it is anecdote driven. We need to be data driven. Terrorism is too important to ignore the data. Data driven, General thank ladies, you so much, uh, I yield back. Time has expired. Uh, Chair recognized Mr. Tiffany for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ann, if I may address you that way, do you believe in the rule of law? Uh, yes. Okay. So parole is a very specific concept in the law here in the United States of America that is supposed to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. That has been wiped out by fiat without passing a law to change the law that enabled parole back in 1954. They have been breaking the law. 80,000 Afghans came in, all waived in via, virtually all um, waived in via parole. So in other words, the reason illegal entries, as you've been saying, have been going down is because they've ignored the law. So you want us to be a lawless country is what we're hearing from you. By the way, from the other side, that fear-mongering conservative who has been talking about this regularly is Mayor Adams from New York City that his city is being destroyed. His quote, not mine. The ranking member talks about no government witness um, that we've heard from. Oh, yes, we have. We heard from Mayorkas back in July. We heard from the FBI two weeks prior uh, to that from Mr. Ray. We heard from Sheriff Mark Daniels from Arizona. Let's share a couple quotes. FBI Director Ray, we are seeing all sorts of very serious, very serious threats uh, that come from across the border. He closed by some, uh, saying, it is becoming more and more of a priority for us. Sheriff Mark Daniels, in regards to fentanyl, the border is not effectively managed right now, and until it is, the cartels, they are the winner of this. I asked Secretary Mayorkas about that. Who's telling the truth? FBI Director Ray or you? He wouldn't answer the question. I asked him, who's telling the truth? Sheriff Mark Daniels, who is seeing the fentanyl flowing in since January 20th of 2021 in numbers that have uh, skyrocketed. And Secretary America says, no, nah, there's not a problem here. Who's telling the truth? He wouldn't answer the question. It's this whole approach that we're hearing. There's nothing to see. For those of you a certain age like me, You'll recognize it as the Sar Sergeant Schultz approach. I see nothing. For those of you that are a little bit younger than I, you'll recognize it as the Harry Potter story with the Ministry of Magic. Mr. Marino, it is said that we have done nothing here. The House of Representatives passed H.R. 2. We have not proposed solutions. Is H.R. 2 a solution to the border uh, crisis that we have? Yes, it is. It restores a layered approach overall to border security and immigration enforcement. It restores law and order. As I previously said, the major causation of this crisis has been the Biden administration's abandonment 
of law and order. And we are seeing this perfect storm of poor policies at the federal level to the local level. Poor policies, abandoning law and order at the federal level, and then it's exploiting the poor policies of abandoning law and order in sanctuary cities. And it's leading to chaos. The one thing that this Biden administration has proven to us is that when you remove all structure through law and order, it results in chaos. Mr. Chairman, I want to highlight here for the American public that may be watching at this point, this body has passed legislation to secure the border, to bring a solution forward. Uh, Mr. Benzman, um, I really appreciate that uh, Representative Biggs brought up the Darien Gap. I was there a little over two years ago. There were lots of people coming through there at that point. The people in Bajo Chiquito, a little Indian village right on the edge of the Darien Gap, were talking about being dis destabilized. I have a text from the last couple days from someone who was down there. The scene is truly apocalyptic. Bajo Chiquito is completely overrun, thousands. They had about 500 when I was there um, that had rolled through that day, and they viewed it as destabilizing. Thousands now, possibly uh, more arriving every second. Is this destabilizing the country of Panama? Actually, uh, Panama has a policy in place called controlled flow, so they are moving all of those migrants through into Costa Rica as fast as possible by bus so that uh, they, do, they do not destabilize the country. They've always done that. Costa Rica does the same thing. Uh, they essentially, the governments uh, are the smugglers in that case. They are moving them through rather quickly. Uh, however, the numbers that are passing through right now, I don't know. Uh, I don't think we've seen anything like this particular uh, number right now that's happening, that's going through. I, I, it will certainly overwhelm the Panamanian and Costa Rican capacity to move them through like normal. So they send them here? They're all coming here. I yield. Everyone's coming here. Uh, thank you, General's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Nadler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since, uh, Mr. Chairman, rather. Uh, since the mayor of my city was invoked, uh, let me say that uh, he is incorrect in saying that this is destroying the city. He is trying to get uh, federal aid because it's a properly a federal, not a city expense. But the fact is the $12 billion figure he mentions is over four years, $3 billion annual uh, expense, which is 3% of the city's budget, which we can absorb with difficulty, although it's properly a federal responsibility, which the mayor is pointing out. Mr. Narasta, I want to discuss some of the terms that are being thrown around by the witnesses and my colleagues. We have heard a lot about migrants who are encountered who are on the terrorist screening data set or the TSDS. Can you discuss this data set in more detail? Who's on this list? Does it only include known or suspected terrorists? It does not only include known and suspected terrorists. There is a reasonable suspicion standard for being included in these, but there is an exception uh, to this uh, based on a rational inference, which as far as we can tell is just when somebody says they should be on there and they put them on there. You know this is true because 99% uh, of people nominated to be on this list by other agencies, by other people in the government uh, are included on there. There is no rigorous test or screening to put people Thank on you. this list. In your testimony, you mentioned that the TSDS includes many false positives. Can you explain what a false positive is and why they appear in the TSDS database? So it's basically an erroneous match, mistaken identity. Uh, to be in this list, you have to have one biographical piece of information, and that's it. So a lot of people get caught up in this list, false flagged uh, because of that. We had a recent case of this with Ali Reza Hadari, an na Iranian national arrested along the border. He was flagged as a watch list. There were a lot of scary news stories about this that came out very rapidly about this Iranian national who was on the terrorist watch list, and then whoops, it was the wrong guy. Thank you. During the Biden administration, we've seen an increase in the number of people on the D TSDS database who have been apprehended along the southwest border. While this is still less than 1% of all apprehensions, can you discuss some of the potential reasons for this increase over the last couple of years? For example, do migration patterns in the hemisphere, including increased migration from Colombia, have something to do with this increase of migrants on the TSDS apprehended on the southeast, southwest border? 
Not only is it very small, it is uh, minuscule, 0.0, hold on, let me count the zeros, 0.007% of people apprehended by Border Patrol in 2023 so far have been on this watch list. Uh, I think that you hit on it directly, sir. Um, Colombians explain a lot of this. I ran a regression analysis this morning uh, about the number of Colombians coming to the border and it has a, it's the best predictor of the number of hits on this watch list. Uh, the CBP does not release the nationalities of people who are on uh, the watch list who come up as hits, but a great Washington Examiner piece that was linked, uh, leaked, uh, had some leaked data, said so that 25 out of 27 of those folks in the first half of 2022 uh, were from uh, Colombia, and as I said, in my uh, written remarks, there's never been a terrorist attack by Colombia and they don't target the US, but there's also a wrinkle in this data, which is when you take a look at border patrol apprehensions that lead to these hits and those through customs, uh, the number has actually gone down, has gone down since 2019. Okay, thank you. I have a number of questions which I'd, I'd like to answer quickly because we only have a minute. We've also recently heard the term special interest aliens. Can you describe what a special interest alien is? Yeah, DHS defines it as a uh, non-US person based on analysis of travel patterns. And well, it's a long definition. A lot of other things are put on this list. Uh, a lot of words in practice. An SIA is just somebody from a country that could have a lot of terrorists in it. It's not a meaningful are, metric. Are special interest aliens terrorists, are they even suspected of terrorism? Uh, no, in fact, um, as DHS... According to one source, yeah. Border Patrol agents encountered 25,000 special interest aliens in fiscal year 2022. That's a lot of people. Has an SIA apprehended by the Border Patrol ever committed an attack on U.S. soil? Uh, no, and DHS explicitly says being an SIA does not mean uh, that you are a terrorist. Thank you. My last question is, is it possible that the number of SIAs have increased in recent years because the decimation of our legal immigration and refugee systems have led people around the world to believe that the only way to immigrate to the United States is via the southwest border? Not only is it possible, I think it is extremely likely and the best explanation for why there has been an increase in illegal immigration and border crossers from around the world and from Central and South America. The U.S. immigration system is extremely restrictive. It is very difficult to come here. The idea that we have an open border is ludicrous. It is totally contrary to all the facts and to what's happening. If we have an open border, why are people paying five to $20,000 to be smuggled here? US, uh, Virginia and Maryland have an open border. I don't have to pay $20,000 to go from my home in Virginia to Maryland. Where is this open border that we keep hearing so much about? Thank you very much. My time has expired. I yield back. Uh, Mr. Roy. Mr. Narasta, prior to September 11th, 2001, how many individuals had flown airplanes into the World Trade Center and killed 3,000 people? Uh, zero. Thank you. Mr. Scott, how many gotaways have there been? 1.7 million known. That means there's evidence, video, whatever, but I can't give you an estimate on how many we don't know in the hundreds of miles of border that are not being patrolled. Mr. Norasta, where are those 1.6 million gotaways? They are most likely at different places in the United States. Who are they? Working and living. Who are they? Well, there are probably people from different countries around the probably. world. Probably, probably. People from all around well, the world. They are from different countries around right. the world, yes, sir. Yeah. How many different countries? Uh, well, if the data that we have uh, about those who are apprehended is any indication, a uh, large number of countries, probably about uh, 162 of them from all over the world? Probably, yes, sir. Right. You willing to bet your family's life, my family's life, on the safety of in our country, irrespective of who these individuals are when you don't even know who they are? Uh, yes, sir. The chance of dying from a foreign-born terrorist attack since 1975 is sure 1 in 4.4 sure, million per Mr. year. Mr. Narasta, I'm sure that is great comfort to the families of the people from 9-11. Because when you sit here and testify that zero people have committed a terrorist attack from crossing our border, I'm sure that is comfort to the people who had terrorist attacks committed by people who came here and overstayed their visas. It is the no fact comfort the matter is, The fact of the, the matter victim. is, when you talk about having an open border, and you minimize the open border by saying that people have to pay $5,000 to come here, 
in that open border, you're ignoring the fact of what that does to human beings when it is in fact so open that that's exactly what's happening. I'm sure that your position is great comfort to the man in Baltimore who was being held up for ransom for $23,000 so that his little girl wouldn't get raped in a stash house in Fort Worth. Have you talked to that little girl or to that father? Was he a terrorism suspect? Have you talked to that father, Mr. Narasta? No, I'm not aware of that terrorism case. What was his name? Have you talked to that father whose little girl was being raped in a stash house? No, I haven't. Is this right. a terrorism-related so you know, issue? I'm answering the questions, and this is the subject matter I want to talk about in this hearing, Mr. Narasta, because you're the one sitting here trying to tell the American people that our border is perfectly fine, What's that it is perfectly okay, that it is, you know, oh, not open because people are paying five or $10,000 to get here. So it is very much relevant that a little girl's getting raped in a stash house because of the policies of you and radical leftists who don't give a damn about it because it is more politically expedient for you to saddle up to the Libertarian Cato Institute or a bunch of radical leftists and talk about, oh, how important it is for people to free flow across borders. I have talked about the chaos repeatedly, the sir. The way to reduce the chaos is through legalization and liberalization, right. not cracking and, down right. more. Will, if you cared about the border chaos, that is the way to do it. Which will perpetuate the lawlessness, and you know it. Mr. Bensman. Exact opposite. Please, Mr. Bensman. Can you please expand on your testimony about dozens of terror watch list foreign nationals apprehended at the southern border being members of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Columbia or FARC and how dangerous that is to this country? Right. One of the most disturbing aspects of the border crisis has been the recent development of FARC-related uh, terror watch listed suspects crossing that border. Those are people who have spent years and years involved in murder, kidnapping, drug trafficking, extortion, bombings. They are experts in weaponry. Uh, these are people who the United States absolutely would never countenance coming across the border and never provide a visa for, certainly. Uh, the fact that FARC members, former uh, of the delisted faction, but also there are two FARC factions that are still listed, uh, that those people would cross our border and come into this United States as anathema to all of our homeland security values, a terrible uh, development uh, that we should pay a lot of attention to because a lot of Colombians are coming across. One of, it is true that uh, so far we, um, we haven't seen an attack. This is a, a relatively new thing for FARC, but uh, one thing that we have to worry about is that when FARC members cross into the United States uh, successfully, they will embed themselves in Colombian uh, immigrant communities and very probably uh, begin intimidation tactics, vigilante justice. Uh, this is a terrible thing for Colombian communities inside the United States in general. Plus, these people are uh, pro professional drug traffickers their whole lives, so we're going to be hearing a lot about FARC people over the next decade. The gentleman's this time is not. Go back. Thank, thank this you, is Mr. not a reason. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, thank you, Mr. Benzman. Next is uh, Ms. Escobar. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Ms. I'd like to thank Mr. Correa for uh, yielding to me, switching with me. Um, I want to thank our witnesses, and this is actually uh, an important opportunity for us as Congress members to look at facts versus fiction in order for us to truly solve the issue at hand. I am the only member of this subcommittee and the larger committee uh, on judiciary who has, was born, raised, lives on the border, raised my two children on the border, and I'm a very proud border resident. There is nobody in the country who wants a safe, secure border more than those of us who've invested our lives living there, creating community there, um, and wanting to make sure our kids can come back to living there. But I, it, it is so important for us to realize and acknowledge this is not an issue related to President Biden. 
Honestly, every time I hear that, it, it undermines the credibility of the person telling me because I live on the border and I know for a fact because I went to facilities during President Trump's administration that were overcrowded and I saw the daily numbers at our shelters. The only time the numbers dropped were immediately after COVID and only for a few months. They went right back up in May of 2020, long before the November 2020 election, long before President Biden was elected, even longer before he was sworn in. So we really, we, we do ourselves and the issue an injustice by politicizing it and blaming the president. Frankly, if there's anyone to blame for the challenges at our border, it's the United States Congress. The United States Congress has failed to reform immigration law for 37 years. And I will tell you, it is absolutely ridiculous for either side to think that one day, if we just wait long enough, we will get everything we want. That's not going to happen. And the only solution is bipartisan compromise. I want to inform my colleagues on the other side of the aisle and on my side of the aisle, we have a bipartisan comprehensive Im immigration reform compromise right now. It's a bill that I worked on and filed with my colleague, Representative Maria, as a Democrat want. It's not everything Republicans want but it's the first bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform bill that has been filed in, in the House of Representatives in a decade. I, where I will agree with critics of the, of the status quo, this is unsustainable. In fact, I get daily reports about how many people are in our shelters in El Paso, how many people have been apprehended. I, I am consistently speaking with migrants, with law enforcement, um, and with NGOs. Congress has to do something. I would invite everyone to begin focusing on what we should be doing within the realm of what's real and achievable in Congress in this political environment so that we can create not just safety and security for all, but those key legal pathways that are critical not just to better managing a border, but critical to us as a country. The, 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 what is so um, distressing about uh, hearings like this is that immigrants are intended to be demonized. Im immigrants make this, this country great. Immigrants have built this country. We need immigrants in order to ensure that we have a sustainable economy. We should be embracing immigrants and fixing broken systems in order to help achieve real solutions. Thank you, Mr. Correa, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Uh, Ms. Sparks. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Norrester, do you believe we should have unlimited immigration to our country? Unlimited? No. So you believe that we need to limit number of immigrants? Yes, I especially believe, you know, security threats, people uh, convicted or So, so we, we, sh we should have some limited. Do you believe we should look at our immigration, how we can better serve our national interest? Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and immigration to the U.S., legal immigration absolutely does that. Okay, so we agree with you on some issues. Do you believe that our system is overwhelmed right now and it's extremely difficult to immigrate to this country legally? It is extremely difficult and restrictive. So it we looks have like some a agreement. Soviet style system. Well, if it's good, that is, we have some agreement. Do you believe that what's happening in the border and how overwhelmed the border it poses national security risks? Uh, there are absolutely risks that are posed by it. They are. So we have a problem over there. We, we, you believe the border need to be secured? Yes, absolutely. And the way to do that is by expanding, I think, legal immigration. Well, that is part of it because we need to have a better and look at that. But do we also need to make sure that we have proper border security, proper mechanism to deal with border security, whichever tools we can do that? Do you believe it needs to be secure a border? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We do need a secure border. We should have a secure border. We just have there are diff different perspectives of how to get there. In the same way 
that uh, you know, Al Capone, a lot of organized crime was crushed by legalizing alcohol. I think that we can crush a lot of cartels and border crime and the chaos on the border, which is a travesty, the chaos is a travesty, do that by increasing legal immigration to the United States to reduce we the have to market. look, it might have some effects, it depends how it is, but ultimately we are not ha right now creating perverse incentive to you know, human traffic and drug traffic and child labor, what's happening right now in places like Darien Gap. Is that correct? What we're doing is bad. I would say that the immigration restrictions we have are an enormous subsidy to cartels and criminal organizations. So we don't have disagreement on that. But let's talk a little bit about, you know, I mean, I have an agreement, this problem being really pointed for uh, many years and not just one president. But do you believe when president is not putting emphasis to help Border Patrol dealing with situation and not dealing right now where we have to overwhelm Border Patrol right, right now, it's magnified opportunities for cartel to take advantage of situation? I think it's a perfect storm of many events. You have a very uh, low unemployment in the United States attracting large numbers of people coming in. I think that you have a restrictive system that makes it difficult for lawful people to come in. And I think you have other security issues that has resulted in a lot of the overwhelming, you know, a lot of this overwhelming of border control. There but, is a lot of chaos. Nobody but, disagrees about that. But do you believe when my, my Democrat colleagues talking about comprehensive reform, it has to have a really significant conversation also over border security and how we can improve border security and be more innovative and make sure that we mitigate some of the risk and support our border patrol. Does it need to be part of it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think the, way, the best way to do that, the best way for border patrol and for the U.S. government to regulate the flow of people in the United States is to legalize it because you can't regulate a black market. But what I said, we can have a debate about legal immigration, but we also should have a debate how we can secure a border barrier, correct? I agree, but I think they're more, I think they're linked. I don't think you can do they're one linked, without the other. They're linked, and we should link, but unfortunately we kind of have in this chicken and egg situation <laughs> where one side says we need to, because it's not, it needs to be a comprehensive solution because this is not a joke situation of that border. It is a national security issue. It is a national security issue, not just for border state. It's for all of the states, whether it's New York or Indiana, and now we allow also, you know, cartels and China to really become in very material drug trafficking and then fentanyl and what's happening in the country. It is going to be a big problem. So I hope you encourage your colleagues to look at the situation too and look how not just, you know, because we never have that conversation. We do it in politicking. And we have a very dangerous situation in the border. We have to acknowledge it as a country. I came here as a legal immigrant. This is country by created by immigrants, but we need to have an orderly process. We cannot have anarchy with the country of law. Otherwise, we will become like third world country with cartels running the country and we cannot let it happen. So I hope you will help me to talk to your colleagues. And I yield back. General lady yields back and Mr. Korea. Thank you, sir, for holding this hearing today. I'm also a member of Homeland Security. I'm the ranking member of the Border Security Subcommittee. And uh, in Homeland, we've probably had at least half a dozen hearings on this issue, Mr. Chairman, and I welcome one in the Immigration Subcommittee. Uh, this is an important issue. National security is important for America. Democrats, Republicans for America. We should be talking immigration, but let's talk border security. I want to remember, remind everybody that the most deadliest attack on American soil, 911, we just had a commemoration across the country to remember, was carried out by folks with visas. One came on a student visa and the rest came on tourist and business visas. I have visited the border a number of times, numerous times, and I've talked to the men and women in uniform and I've asked them, what is it that makes your job better? What can make you more successful? The answer is intel, working with good intelligence, working with allies across the globe, Brazil, Mexico, the Middle East. That's what's helped you identify terrorists. In fact, if folks are interested in working with us, Chairman 
Clay Higgins and I have a bill, H.R. 4575, that will enable us to work much closer with our allies across the globe to make sure we have better intel. But when you talk about undocumented terrorism, we're gonna mix them up? Okay, let's talk about terrorism and undocumented. If I can have this poster behind me. This is an undocumented soldier, an undocumented Marine. Does he look like a terrorist? Mr. Bestman, does that look like a terrorist to you? Mr. Nosworth, Mr. Moreno, Mr. Scott, is that a terrorist behind us? He made the ultimate sacrifice right after 9-1-1. And there's a lot more dreamers in American uniform who will probably be undocumented after the Supreme Court rules on the status of dreamers in the United States. I just want to make sure people understand terrorism versus immigration versus undocumented workers. Now, gentlemen, if I can, I'm gonna ask each and every one of you, do you favor deporting 10 million taxpaying undocumented workers from the U.S. right now? Mr. Scott, yes or no? I believe in the rule of law. And do you, the law, you, do you accountable. would you deport them right now? It's a yes or no. If judge ordered they should be deported, I would deport them. Mr. Moreno. It's impossible yes to Yes or do. no, would you deport them right now? Yes. Mr. Runsworth. Uh, no, and I would try to legalize Mr. Bestman. Yes. Yes. Okay. Would you support an amendment to H.R. 2, the immigration reform bill just passed by the majority, that would essentially exempt farm workers from mandatory E-Verify? Would you support that amendment? Mr. Scott? No, I believe E-Verify is a Mr. very- Mr. Marino? Possible. No. Mr. Bestman. E-Verify has to happen. That was the chairman's amendment to HR2. Let's come back to terrorism. Let's talk about Colombia. Okay, FARC was essentially decertified as a terrorist organization in 2020. Is that correct? 2021, is that correct, yes or no? Yes. Yeah, so, but yet we continue to talk about members of FARC a civil war that happened 20 years ago as terrorists. Is this refugee movement something unique to the United States, or is this something that's worldwide? Mr. Scott, worldwide or U.S.? I believe there are struggles. Mr. Marino, I got less than a minute, guys. Come on. I couldn't hear the question, sir. Is the refugee movement something unique to the United States, or is this a worldwide phenomena? No, it's not unique. It's worldwide? Yes, sir. Colombia right now is holding three million, hosting three million Venezuelan refugees. And we just talked about Colombia as being a source of the problem. And in my 20 seconds left, and the trips I've taken to Latin America recently, I think we have to think about the border challenge on a worldwide scale, okay? We have a lot of allies south of the border that are holding, that are hosting refugees are working with us. And for us to sit here and talk about what's going on at that border, I think as policymakers is very wrong. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield. General yields back, and Mr. Van Drew. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to deviate from what I was going to say. I almost don't know where to start, but other than to say, Mr. Noraster, I disagree and sometimes agree and partially agree with people. I disagree with you so totally. Um, you're sitting in your safe office looking at facts that you believe are accurate, which they're not, and not talking to the people who live at the border, the people who work at the border, the people that are suffering, whether it's in Arizona, California, uh, Texas, and now, of course, the entire United States of America. Let me say one thing. Anybody that believes this problem is only a problem for the southern border is wrong. This is a problem for the United States of America. You know, just to give you a little example, a little different route didn't come over the border. Did you ever hear of a man by the name of Danilo Cavalcante? He's the escaped, I know, quite a sensational thing that went on. German Shepherd got him, thank God. This is a man that murdered his friend in Brazil. 
illegally because he's a murderer, got into Puerto Rico, and then from Puerto Rico got to Florida and then came up to Pennsylvania. Had an argument with his girlfriend. He stabbed her with a butter knife 38 times. 38 times. And, you know, nobody's demonizing immigration. We are almost all of us either sons and daughters or immigrants ourselves. Immigration is a good thing. Legal immigration. What happened to the idea of the rule of law? Frankly, Mr. Norastor, I don't care what you think sitting in your safe office or removed from everybody playing with some numbers. Go and talk to people. People who have suffered. And you know who's suffering too? A lot of the illegal immigrants because they're being used. They're being used by these individuals that we know are dispensing drugs, are hurting children, are involved with human trafficking, drug trafficking. We call them the drug cartel. Now establishing business in the United States. So the answer is not to just go willy-nilly and radically increase, radically increase the number of illegal immigrants. The answer is to have real borders. The answer is to have the rule of law. And once you establish that, then you look into what needs to be done in our immigration system. We need to support our individuals who are trying to protect us at the border. I feel so badly for them because they are so much held back from doing their job. You know, last, last week I learned of an administration proposal from the Biden administration. And, you know, it, by the way, because of the New York City problem, what did we expect? It's a sanctuary city. New Jersey, where I live, is a sanctuary state. You're saying to people, we're going to fund you, we're going to take care of you, we welcome you, we will give you legal defense. But we don't take care of our own people. Our veterans still don't get what they need. We have a mental health crisis in America. We have an educational crisis in America. But we don't have the money and time for that. But we have the money and time to take God knows who, some of them good people, but doing it the wrong way. Some of them not. And you know, according to your figures, never has any one of them done anything bad. That's just not accurate. It's not. So consider the national security implications of they want to do to my state. I live in southern New Jersey, Atlantic City Airport. We have the 177th Fighter Guard. You have the uh, uh, FAA Technical Center. Serious, serious facilities that need to be protected. The, the 177th protects the Washington to New York corridor. They wanted up to 60,000 people they're talking about in a town of 50,000 people. That's going to really do well for the education system. But it's your idea. You want to open it up. So let's, let's open it all up. Every country in the world, whether they're good, bad, or otherwise, just let them, let them open it up. We can't absorb that. And I'm, you're not going to answer yet. This is especially concerning given recent reports that we have that there are ISIS sympathizers smuggling Russian and Eastern Europeans across the border. And terrorists have been apprehended who are real terrorists at our port of entry. I don't know where you get your stats from, but we also get stats that are good. So the situation's out of control. Chief Scott, in your written testimony, you mentioned how the terrorist attacks of September 11th were perpetrated by individuals who entered the country through ports of entry. Is the United States at an elevated risk of any type of terrorist attack given the state of the southwest border? You're a chief. You have the only want to say what's the truth. Tell us the truth. I, I believe we are, and we forget that there would have been 20 attackers, but one was actually caught by a CBP officer that interviewed him. We're not doing those interviews at the Southwest border. The cartel's picking and choosing who enters our country right now instead of us. And that is a significant threat to this country. Mr. Norastor, so General you think- time has expired. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Man, I'm fired up. I'm sorry. Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, we've talked a lot, and I don't think any of us in here are against legal immigration, but immigration builds a nation, but an invasion destroys a nation. What we have going on on the southern border right now is an invasion. We basically replaced the population of my entire state with people we really don't know who they are. And, uh, you know, as Mr. Norasta, is that how you say your name? Uh, Norasta. Norasta, the Remain in Mexico policy that the Trumps had in place, that, wouldn't that help vet people before they came here? Because I understand that the minute we did away with the Remain in Mexico, people started pouring in here and then applying for asylum. And the, so we gave them a cell phone and sent them on their way in buses or whatever the case may be. But... Don't you think in some ways that would help us vet the people coming across the border? 
I don't think it would do too much better than what's going on right now. I mean, the main problem is that you just have a large number of people who are well, coming well, me, up, all me, the asylum and non-asylum. Let me ask you this then. Sheriff Daniels testified, he four decades on the U.S. southern border. He wasn't in an office. He's actually on the border. He said the best he'd ever seen the border was in 2018. He said the worst he's ever seen is today. So you mentioned the $5,000 to $20,000. That seems to kind of become the going price now. How do those people... Mr. Morano, how do they pay that money back? If Say if you're wanting to come to the country and you're coming from Venezuela and it's $8,000, what do those people, how do they pay that money back to the cartel? Is it a cash up front deal or do they make installment payments? Are they indentured servants or are they just drug mules? They work it off while in the United States and it comes in all different forms in terms of how they pay that off. This is where we're extremely susceptible to terrorist organizations, because depending on who funds in advance the money to the migrants to make this journey, um, their families are going to be held to account back in the, the country of origin where they start, and the migrant, once they enter the United States, is basically at the beck and call. It's an extension. So you're saying they're either bond servants or slaves? Is that what our government is doing? That's exactly right. And, and this, is, this is more pervasive than most people think. Um, this is a huge problem. Um, most of these migrants don't have a way to pay in advance these, these funds to be trafficked across the border. So the overwhelming majority are going to do the beck and call work of the cartels and whoever else the cartels are working with. And so they have to make those payments or else the cartel goes and finds a family or, or something it's, horrible it, happens. It's a fact. I've studied this for decades and decades. This is a long-term payment plan. If they don't do what they're told, families die in the countries of origin and the person here. And this has gotten dramatically worse since January of 2020. Dramatically. Mr. Scott, I heard that... Uh, this is an option, too, that if you didn't have the money, you could actually backpack heroin, cocaine, or fentanyl to pay your passage. So instead of installment payments, you could actually backpack drugs, become a mule, if you will, to the cartel in that paid passage. Is that also a case? Have you heard that? I just happened to hear that when I was at the border. Yeah, I agree with the prior witness, everything you said, and that is also another way that you can pay is by trafficking drugs or doing any service for the cartel. Chief, you said that the CBP caught one of the 9-11, uh, one of the 20, I guess, my understanding is the other 9-11 pilots or terrorists, whatever we want to call them today, they actually overstayed their visas. I believe that is accurate. The, the one individual in DHS didn't exist yet, so it was Legacy Customs, but was doing a good interview and believed that, that something wasn't right with that individual and denied him injury. And it's believed that would have been the 20th. The others, Mr. Benzman, any of you guys want to answer this, had we actually enforced the laws on the books and when the visa ex has expired, the visa expired, it was sent them back, this could have been averted, could it have not? Well, and it doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I, believe, I believe it could be. I, I really want to highlight, too, though, we identified that threat. We worked on that threat for years within CH, CBP and DHS, but we never ignored, no matter what you do to criminals and terrorists, they're going to try to do something else. We knew they would go to the southwest border. That was part of the planning. That was the second phase. We're seeing it now. The threat is real. So, um, Chief, you are warning us now that there is a problem. Yes, definitely. Go ahead, Mr. Marana. Yes, and, and, and we are certainly in an elevated risk environment. I oversaw the implementation of the National Terrorism Advisory System, and I'd actually like to see it used the way we intended it to be used. Uh, instead of sending out bulletins on things like disinformation and number one threats that are not the number one threats, I have yet to see an NTAS bulletin issued about the crisis on the southwest border and the threat level that it accurately represents. It's not a system to be politicized, and it's obviously being politicized. There should un no doubt be a National Terrorism Advisory System bulletin for an elevated threat environment for what's going on at our border currently. Thank you. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman is back, Ms. Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, so, and thanks so much to the witnesses for being here. I want to echo Ranking Member Nadler's comments about the timing of this hearing. 
It's three days after the anniversary of the worst terrorist attack the United States has ever seen. And this week should be a time for all of us in Congress to reflect on the impact of terrorism and what we can do to make our country safer from attacks like the one that we saw on 9-11. But this hearing is not really respecting the legacy of 9-11. Rather, scheduling this hearing for this week, um, the majority is using the tragedy of September 11th to justify their immigration agenda that does not solve all of the immigration issues that are before us, as my colleague, Congresswoman Escobar, laid out. And it's painful to see the legacy of 9-11 twisted in this political manner. As we've heard from Mr. Narasta, there have been no murders or injuries committed by terrorists who have illegally entered the United States through the U.S.-Mexico border in the past 48 years. This hearing doesn't reflect that reality, nor does it provide a forum for a genuine discussion about how to make our country safer from the terrorists who are most likely to come here. The other, if the other side wanted to do that, they'd work with us to address homegrown terrorists who have committed many of the more violent attacks in the United States, particularly recently. And if they wanted to make our country safer, they'd work with us to provide security to schools, churches, movie theaters, and keep the guns out of the hands of violent individuals with extremist belief. Mr. Narasta, could you remind the subcommittee, how did the 9-11 terrorists enter the United States? The eight, uh, 19 9-11 hijackers entered lawfully. 18 of them entered on tourist visas. One of them entered on a student visa, and they were lawfully present uh, at the time of the attacks. And is entry through the southern border in any way connected to terrorist activity in the United States? Uh, it has not been uh, historically, and there is very little indication that it is currently. And what is the likelihood that someone will be murdered by a foreign-born terrorist in the United States? Based on data from 1975 through the end of 2022, the annual chance of being murdered is about 1 in 4.4 million per year. By comparison, the chance of being mur murdered in a non-terrorist homicide is about 1 in 20,000 per year, or about 316 times greater. And um, if members of this committee want to look at the way to improve national security and um, terrorist threats, what would you recommend we do? I think the number one thing to do in this scenario is to increase lawful immigration so that we can control the border. I think the other witnesses up here actually made a fantastic case for doing that when talking about the smuggling and the human rights violations and how the cartel has got their fingers dug in deep to this black market. If you don't like that, the one surefire way to get rid of it to exclude the black market from this is to legalize that flow so folks can come illegally. If people can buy a plane ticket from their home country and come here lawfully after being vetted, they're not gonna pay cartels $10,000 or smuggle them across a jungle and then a desert where they're gonna be, have a good chance of being raped or murdered, etc. The way to control and to regulate this market is through legalization. We just cannot Regulate it is impossible to regulate a black market. We need to legalize it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. General Lady yields back. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Hunt for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When 9 11 happened, I was a sophomore at West Point. I was sitting in my barracks, Eisenhower Barracks, as I recall, on the third floor, and I watched with terror. 3,000 souls leave this earth. At that moment, as a sophomore at West Point, I knew, and my classmates knew, West Point class, class of 2004, actually three of us are currently serving in the halls of Congress right now, we knew that we were all going to go to war. We knew 
that there was a chance that we would not make it back alive, but by God, we were gonna do whatever it took to protect our country and to prevent something like that from ever happening again. And this is why protecting this country and protecting our southern border means so much to me. The open borders that we're seeing right now at our southern border is a slap in the face to everyone who has sacrificed to keep anything like 9-11 from happening again in our great country. We lost a lot of blood, a lot of treasure to keep our nation safe, including many of my West Point classmates that are no longer with us. We were told that if we fought terror abroad, we could keep it from coming in our own country. And I still believe that to this day. It's because of Joe Biden, and we have now essentially turned our southern border into a welcome mat for terrorists. Now, the Biden administration would like you to believe that every person coming across our border is an asylum seeker simply looking for a better life. That's not only a lie, it's insulting to our intelligence. This administration says that illegal aliens or women and children wanting a better opportunity, and I have some numbers for you that would point out the contrary. Since October 2022, CBP flagged 75,000 illegal aliens in our country as national security risks. Last year, CBP announced that 98 illegal aliens on a terrorist watch list on our southern border. 98. That is nine times the number of people encountered on the terrorist watch list than during Trump's entire presidency. But wait, there's more. Just last week, the Office Inspector General released their audit of DHS titled, DHS does not have assurance that all migrants can be located once released into the United States. Quick recap of what's going on here. We have 75,000 illegal immigrants living amongst us who are national security risk currently. CBP is encountering illegal aliens on the terrorist watch list at a record rate, and DHS is releasing illegal aliens, their national security risk, to the interior of our country, and you can't even tell us where they are. Why do we have a terrorist watch list? If people on our terrorist watch list can simply walk into our open southern border, then why do we have one at all? How is it possible that the FBI has no problem hunting down January 6th protesters years later, but this administration has lost track of illegal aliens who pose a real threat to our national security? We know this administration could track down anyone, anytime, anywhere. We've seen them do it. Why? It's my opinion that this administration views patriots, or as the Biden administration calls them, MAGA Republicans as national security threats while viewing illegal aliens on the terrorist watch list as asylum seekers simply looking for a better life. We live in an upside down world today where Americans are vetted and surveilled more than illegal aliens that we know have the propensity to break the law. It's not an oversight, it's not a mistake. This is a choice. We have billionaires right now that are putting patrons in space for sport. And you mean to tell me that we cannot stop illegal immigrants that clearly pose a threat to our national security from entering our country? And I have a report that says it. Now, many of my colleagues on the left, you know, they want to say that, well, if you have border security, you know, that's racist or that's wrong or, or you're xenophobic. I'm not. I'm pro-America. I am pro-preserving the values of our country and having a sovereign border. Six and a half million people entering our country illegally is ridiculous. Enough fentanyl has poured into this country to kill every American six times. It's ridiculous. And I'm somebody that's willing to die for this country and to keep it safe. We cannot continue this. It is time for us to fix our southern border. Thank you. I yield back the rest of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I'll now uh, recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Scott, you served as chief of the Border Patrol uh, uh, through the end of the Trump administration and the beginning of the Biden administration. Ms. Escobar and others have assured us there really was no difference in policy between those two administrations. Was that your uh, observation? 
I, it's completely misses the mark. And I will go beyond that. I was in the Border Patrol for 29 years, not just during the Trump administration. I was in San Diego when the Clinton administration said, illegal immigration is a threat to this country. We need to do something about it. And we came up with an operation and we started using things called fences, same as a wall. And we started using consequences. What, what impact, we addressed it. What impact did the Biden policies have on the uh, security of our southern border? It reversed the entire like 29 years of my career. It reversed all the progress we made and completely decimated border security. Would you say that these changes are responsible for the crisis we now see at that border? 100% because it's catch and release. Mr. Nadler assures us that, well, don't worry, everybody who comes across is subject to, in his words, rigorous vetting procedure. Would you uh, elucidate on that? Yeah, the information they give the officer, their name, their, and even the fingerprints are bounced off of a database here in the United States that has minuscule information about foreigners in it. So it's the equivalent of checking them in basically an empty hard drive. So you're, you'd once described it as, uh, as, as checking it against a blank sheet of paper. Correct. Because we don't have that information and then they're allowed in. It sounds really good. Uh, it's really doing nothing. It's the interviews where the agents, and they look at their tattoos, they look at their face, they figure out are they telling you the truth. That's where you find things out and that is not taking place today because of the massive flow. Because of the massive flow. And yet the Democrats say the, the solution to this is we need to increase that massive flow. We need to legalize all of this so that everybody coming in uh, has a chance to go through that very process. Um, uh, how thorough would that be? I, I like to actually use facts as well. And the fact is every time, and this goes beyond immigration, every time there's been a consequence for a crime, a deterrent and a consequence, that crime has gone down. When we had consequences on the border and we held people until the judge adjudicated their case, the flow stopped because the vast majority of the asylum seekers are fraud. That's the solution, just enforce the law. Okay, now the, the two numbers that I've been focused on are the 2.6 million illegal aliens that the administration has deliberately allowed into this country, despite the federal law says they should be detained. Uh, and in addition to that, the 1.7 million known gotaways, people that the Border Patrol observed crossing the border but simply couldn't intercept because they're completely overwhelmed. As I said in my uh, introductory remarks, this is a, com a population larger than the combination of New Mexico and West Virginia put together. If we legalize that, we're gonna get more of it, obviously. How thorough can the vetting process be under such circumstances? There's, the, there's no bandwidth for that. So it's nice to talk about things, theory is great, but in reality, there's only a certain number of agents and officers. It takes two hours for a CBP officer to process, process one of these asylum seekers at a port, about an hour and a half for border patrol agents. Just do the math, there would be no enforcement. And then back to New York, they can't handle 100,000, how many is too many? Seriously, we can't, this is unsustainable. Uh, Mr. Naresta, um, 5,000 terrorists released from Parowan. We know where one of them went. One of them 10 days later went to Abbey Gate and detonated the bomb that killed 13 uh, US service members. Can you tell us where the other 5,000 are? I'm sorry, can you tell me the name of that individual? I missed the first part of that. The, the, the terrorist who uh, uh, detonated the bomb came from Parowan. Where are the other 5,000 that were released that day? Which bomb? The bomb that was detonated at the Kabul airport. Oh, in Kabul. Oh, don't play dumb, come on. No, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, the, the, that, you mean in, in Afghanistan? Uh, in Afghanistan. If you want to play dumb, play dumb. I'm done asking you questions. I'm sorry, is this about the with southwest the, I'm border? I'm this game with the Is this about terrorism on the border? Um, Mr. Uh, Benzman, we talk about legalizing the process. Don't we already have a legal process availed by millions of people to enter this country legally who obey all of our laws, who do everything our country's asked of them? Uh, isn't that system already in existence? Isn't the problem that we have millions of people now flouting that law? Yes, and I, I think after 9-11, a lot was done to enhance the uh, counterterrorism kind of security screening measures for a lot of those, which I uh, believe made it more difficult. They do fail still sometimes, uh, but, but I believe that with this mass migration crisis that the balance is shifting where uh, people, bad guys across the world are well aware that our border now is a vulnerability and they can get through. There was just recently uh, in July a case in Ohio, FBI case that just wrapped up. 
that involved a, an Iraqi asylum seeker. Uh, he, was, he is the pleaded guilty now uh, defendant uh, whose plot involved bringing four Iraqi terrorists over the border to kill President George Bush, former President George Bush. Uh, that was a, a, a legitimate counterterrorism case. And what it shows us is that uh, they're looking, the bad guys are looking at that border right now. Well, and, uh, and, and as I way. recall, he, he actually said that he was now bringing his accomplices in through the southern border because it's right. so much easier than abusing the, the, the visa process. Uh, my time's expired, and uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I want to thank all the members who uh, joined us uh, for today's questioning. Uh, this will conclude the hearing. Uh, I'd like to thank the witnesses for appearing. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. And without objection, the hearing is adjourned.